of this extraordinary, the doubling of defense spending after 9-11. And what is that being done to the economy? Well, I'll tell you what it means is we don't have the money for schools. We don't have the money to fix our roads and bridges and public transportation. We don't have the money for health care. We can't do what we need to do in this country. And if I were asked, you know, what would one of my planks be in terms of change, I'd say at least, at least half the, half the defense budget. <laughs> yes, sir. One other idea here is uh, take the money, take your money out of the big banks and put it in your local credit union. Yes. Another question or an idea is, let's make sure that capital gains are taxed the same as income, as ordinary income is taxed. Now some of you, some yes. of you that, not, may not, that may not mean very much, but what, that, what it really means is you've got some extraordinarily rich people, they are taxed at a rate of 15%, which is the capital gains rate, because they have managed to make most of their income look as though it's capital gains. And that's just not fair. And that's when Warren Buffett talks about his secretary being taxed at a lower rate than he's taxed. That's what he's talking about. You know, many of these themes come back to the same fundamental issue of fairness. They come back to the same fundamental issue of we are all in this together. And that is the choice. In other words, do you agree we're just a bunch of individuals? We're on, your, we're on our own? It's kind of uh, survival of the fittest? That's one political philosophy. Social Darwinism. The other political philosophy is, and I think you all agree, we are all in it together. Yeah. And we turn in enough people who are actually there. In other words, one way of repealing the antitrust laws or repealing the securities laws is just to underfund the agencies, and that's what they're doing. Reagan started not enforcing the Sherman Antitrust Act. Ronald Reagan was the progenitor. He was one of the originators of not enforcing the antitrust laws. Absolutely. Because under their view, under their view, you don't really have to worry about size as long as there's economic efficiency. Well, I'll tell you something. If we've learned anything over the last four years, when you're talking about the big banks on Wall Street, or you're talking about BP and the oil spill, or you're talking about Massey Energy and that mine cave that killed miners. Or you're talking about the big insurance companies in America. If there's anything we've learned is that with size comes political power, and with political power comes unaccountability. And we need regulation. Of course we need regulation. To do a system that is so oriented to the bottom line with regard to some big, big companies that the human element, the element that says, this economy is for us. We are not for it. This economy is for us. Gets completely lost. We've got to make sure that the economy is no longer simply turning on the bottom line, on corporate profits. The test of an economy is not how many corporate profits it can generate, but the quality of life it generates for its yes. people. Yeah. Yes. It's a time for a third party. Here's the problem with a third party. We have a winner-take-all system. That is, if you, if you get the state of Oklahoma or the state of California 51%, that means you've got it all. And in a kind of winner-take-all system, a third party tends to split the vote of the people who are on one side of the ideological spectrum. So, I don't know how you feel about Ralph Nader. I think he's a great American in many respects. But when Ralph Nader came in there and took some votes, yep. he helped, he helped George W. Bush, yep. even though Al Gore won the election in 2000. That's right. That's right. Yeah. What, about the, what about the Supreme Court case that said, well, the Supreme Court, that said that George Bush was guilty of you know, rigging the election in 2004 in Ohio with the votes jumping over on the machine and yeah. the votes going out to the Republican Party, then to the town meeting. Let me, let me just say this, because many of these questions are, again, connected to each other. And this is important. 
one of our great enemies, and one of the enemies that you and I and others must fight, is cynicism. Do you hear me? Yep. So many people, so many young people, so many old people, so many people in this country say nothing can be done. Nothing can be done. And the minute people say nothing can be done, you know something? The other side wins. Because yeah. nothing will be done. Woo! Give us a little history and perspective of the other anti-Wall Street movements where they call them money crabs and devil fish and all those drugs. Uh, uh, look, uh, the question is, the other movements throughout history, there have been populist movements, there have been populist movements and progressive movements through history. And by the way, every one of these movements have laid the foundation for what has come next. Anybody who looks at American history must know that there are two great forces at work in America. One is the progressive force, moving to the future, inclusion, social equity, equal opportunity, the sense that we're all in it together. Yo. And the other force is the regressive force, which stands for the proposition that we're all just individuals and we want to go back to a system fundamentally in which it's just survival of the fittest. Now, one thing that should give you all courage, and it gives me courage, is that every time those two great forces have clashed, the progressive forces have always, always won. won. We, shall, we shall overcome yeah. one day. Multinational CEOs like to uh, think of themselves as John Galt type heroic characters pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. Yeah, and Rand. Can you tell us some ways in which big multinational corporations benefit from the largesse of taxpayers? Uh, the question is how do big corporations benefit from the largesse of taxpayers? Let me count the ways. <laughs> And there are subsidies, oil and gas, and there are subsidies for the pharmaceutical industry. Why do you think the pharmaceutical industry got that special break? So that Medicare would not use its bargaining leverage to get low drug prices. Every major industry in America, it's welfare. because of its political power and because we don't have adequate campaign finance laws and we don't have adequate controls on independent expenditures and lobbyists, Every major industry in America gets directly or indirectly subsidized by you and by me and by everybody else here. And look at Wall Street. Look at the bailout of Wall Street if you want to see it absolutely close up. Well, it's about time average working people got bailed out. Yeah. It's about time yeah. we all help each other yep. rather than simply help the rich get richer. Yeah. Bank up the banks. You know Pull your money out. Now look at Here's another important principle. It's tempting to say all rich people are bad. That's not the case. Some very wealthy people in this country have behaved enormously responsibly. What we're talking about is those people in the top 1% who have abused their wealth, who are using it to entrench their privilege, like the Koch brothers. We want a society in which, look, and even, I'll tell you something that is absolutely important and truthful, and that is, even if you are very rich, you would do better having a smaller share yes. of yes. a rapidly growing economy yes. than a big share of an economy that's dead in the water yes. because average working people don't have enough purchasing power Woo. to keep it going. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. We hold our nose and vote for Obama when he has criminals in charge of the economy. That's your question. <laughs> now, let me let me just let me just say something. Call corrupt. You can have the best people in Washington, and they are not going to be able to do very much that's good unless good people are organized and mobilized and energized outside Washington to push them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can criticize. I, you know, a lot of people come up to me and they criticize people in Washington, and I say to them back. What are you doing about it? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the answer. What are you doing about it? Don't pay your taxes. Don't give me the money. That didn't, that didn't answer. I'm just going to repeat what was said. And I'm paraphrasing, but I think I, I think I got what you said. And that is, even though you're not enthusiastic about Obama, the alternative, the Republicans, are going to be so much worse, they're going to take us back to the Stone Age. And so what we need to do 
is vote for Obama and vote for the Democrats and then understand that that is only the beginning. That's only the beginning of our responsibility. Then we've got to push and continue to push and push hard. Yes. Some people in the media, they're going to say, oh, this is over. It's not going to be over. It's never going to be over. You can't stop this once it's started. based economy when corporations that run the economy are amoral and they're just based on profits. That's what they're supposed to do. Corporations exist for only one reason, and that is to make money. That's the only reason they exist. So how do you create a moral-based economy? You create it right starting here. The people are the only hope we have for changing the rules, changing the laws. How did we get a 40-hour work week? Unions. How did we get Social Security? How did we get unemployment insurance? How did we get worker safety and worker health? How did we get anything that we believe in that we need? We did it because people mobilized and they organized. We didn't wait for the corporations. So we need all of you to come back. These are moral questions. What kind of society and economy do we want to have? Every major movement in America has started with a moral question. The civil rights movement, the, the, the get out of Vietnam, anti-Vietnam movement, every movement before that, the, the first progressive movement, these are fundamental moral questions. What kind of a society and what kind of economy do we want? And they are fundamentally questions that only we can answer. We, we, the people. Collecting tuition and tuition, and nonprofits must be about raising funds, and government must be about collecting taxes. That sounds cynical to me, sir. But let me, <laughs> let me let me let me say that if corporations, he says, are about making money, then not for profits or must be about collecting tuition and whatever else non for profits collect, and government must be about collecting taxes. In other words, what you are saying is it's all about money. That's all it is. No, I'm not. No. Good. I'm glad you're not. <laughs> just because, the, just the, I'm oh, okay. The because I was hoping you were saying just the opposite, but it sounded like that's what you were saying. My, my point, the point that I made before, and I want to emphasize, is if we think that there are such things as morally compelled corporations, or that there's socially corporate social responsibility. You know, we're fooling ourselves, because that's not what a corporation exists for. A corporation exists to make money for its shareholders. That's what a corporation is chartered to do. If a corporation doesn't do that, it's going to be taken over by people who will make sure that that corporation does. That's what happens again and again. But wait a minute, I'm not cynical. <laughs> that is why we need laws and rules and a public voice. That's why we need limitations on the power and the wealth of corporations to corrupt our political process. That's why we are in the fix we are in. We cannot rely on corporations to respond to the needs of average working people and most of the people of this country. We have to stick up for ourselves. Yeah. Yes. Deregulation is bullshit. Without dealing with citizens united first. There are about, I, I count four horrible Supreme Court decisions that I know about historically. Among them are Dred Scott, and Plessy against Ferguson, and Bush against Gore. Tell me about but in that four, let's not forget Citizens United against the Federal Election Commission. Yes. And what we've yes, got to do yes. is we've got to work to make sure that when the next Supreme Court vacancy occurs, that Supreme Court vacancy is filled with somebody who is pledged to repealing 
Citizens United. Yes. 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 Debt piled on debt piled on debt. We're watching the Eurozone and seeing the austerity packages in Greece and Italy, and to me, they're just cutting and cutting and cutting. Also, they can pay the interest on the debt. Debt on more debt. Let me, the question is about debt. Do not be fooled about this. We have a jobs crisis and we've got a wage crisis. We do not have a debt crisis. We could have a debt crisis 10 or 15 years from now especially if we don't get the economy going and we don't get jobs back. The number one responsibility, the number one goal is jobs and wages in the economy. The debt scare, the debt panic is not real. Over the long term, you know why the debt's going up? Over the long term it's going up because health care costs are going up. And that's pushing Medicare and Medicare costs up. And what we've got, and unfunded wars as well. And what we've got to do is not only cut the defense budget, but we have also got to move to a single payer system in this country. Yes. 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 You see again, you see how it's all connected up. Yes. It's all connected up. Everything that we're talking about, all the dots are connected up with each other. Instead of fighting for a single payer over here and fighting for better environment and against global climate change over here and fighting for something over here, it's all connected to enormous wealth and power at the top that is not allowing the people to do what the people need to do. Role in the current crisis. We talked about that a little bit before. The Federal Reserve, the one the Federal Reserve failed to do. And Alan Greenspan was head of the Federal Reserve, and this is one of his worst legacies. He failed to oversee the banks. He reduced interest rates to almost near zero, and then he said, we don't need to worry and we don't need to regulate. And when you reduce interest rates to zero and make money essentially free to the banks, and then you say, oh, by the way, we're not going to regulate them. We're going to let you do what you want to do, banks, with all that money. You are begging for trouble, and that is exactly what happened. And who got in trouble? Not the banks. Well, they did initially, but they got bailed out. Who got in trouble? We did. We, the people, the institution itself. Yes. UAWCIO. Yeah, look at, let me say something about that. The union movement in this country is one of the most important movements to towards social betterment we have had in America. Yes. One of the problems. In 1955, in 1955, over a third of all private sector union of workers were unionized. And you know what that meant? That meant that people had bargaining power. That meant that average workers could go to companies and say, you have got to split the profits with us. Right now in the private sector, fewer than 8% of workers are unionized. And the, loss, and the loss of union power is directly correlated, is directly related to the decline of bargaining power of average working people in this country. And so part of what we do, and I don't mean a plank, I don't mean a plan, I don't mean a, a, a set of demands. I'm talking about the moral center of what we do is to strengthen trade unions. Yeah. Uh, question is, what about campaign finance reform? If I had to name one thing, one thing that was going to be number one on my list, because everything else we want, whether it's universal health care, single payer, genuine reforms with regard to climate change, getting back to an economy that's working for all of us, everything else we talk about, nothing is possible unless we get money out, out of, of politics. politics. Yes. 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 That's it. I'm the, the bubble of New York and the bubble of San Francisco. Well, here's the good news. All over America, all over America, people are joining together in this movement. In cities and places that people thought there was no energy, no progressive energy at all. 
and the alliances are going to be made and already are being made. From Occupy San Francisco and Occupy Oakland and Occupy LA and Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Atlanta and Occupy all over America. Those are the alliances. Those are the grassroots alliances that are going to change this country. Yes. Tucson, Boise. Somebody who has not... Uh, yes. If we here begin to think of ourselves as a special group needing special particular things, even though those things are terribly important, then we lose the strength that comes in unity. Yes. Do it together. We are all we together. Are one. Every one together. of us is and together. We are the 99. This is a people movement. We are the 99%. Yes!